Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the in this first uh, virtual science forum speakers corner seminar for 2022. Today we have uh, Dr. Jing Lei Zhang from from uh, University of Waterloo Institute for Quantum Computing. Uh, Ching Lei got her PhD from Aarhus University under the supervision of Klaus Melmer. This is how I had the pleasure to meet her and work with her. And since then, she's been a postdoctoral fellow at IQC. And today she will talk about some of her recent really cool ideas about simulating high energy physics on quantum computers. So with that, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, perfect. So the title of my talk is SU2 Hadrons on a Quantum Computer. So that's what I'm going to deliver to you at the end, some quantum computation about particles in a SU2 lattice gauge theory. Uh, so I will start my talk uh, by giving you some motivation, some context about the field, because I think it's relatively new. Um, and then I will tell you more specifically about the lattice gauge theory that we consider, which is an SU2 lattice gauge theory. Uh, I will tell you about the specific quantum algorithm that we decided to use in order to simulate it. Uh, and then we show you the result of this uh, computation, which, as I said, is the quantum computation of hadron masses for this model. Um, and then there will be just a quick conclusion and some outlook. And then here you can just see the pictures of the team that worked with me. It's a, a team at the Institute for Quantum Computing at Waterloo and our collaborator at York University here in Toronto. Um, okay, so um, this work is within the bigger field of quantum simulation for lattice gauge theories, and specifically we consider lattice gauge theories for high energy physics. And um, uh, as many of us know, uh, lattice gauge theories are one of the main tools in, in high energy physics, and they are the main tool that we have to describe interactions uh, between fundamental particles. So they essentially form the standard model, which is to date our best description of elementary particles. And they describe specifically interactions between uh, particles that are mediated by gauge fields. Um, and um, uh, these, uh, besides uh, the analytical methods, uh, lattice gauge theories has been an extremely successful field, um, which through the discretization of a time space lattice allowed for uh, classical numerical computation of this model and allowed us to learn uh, enormous amount of information about this theory with incredible precision. Since the, when it started in the 70s with the first lattices, with the first computers, parallel with the development of uh, um, more and more powerful classical computer, it really has been an extremely rich and fruitful and fruitful field. So um, the main classical method that is used is called Markov chain, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and it is based on an action formulation of the theory. Um, however, uh, for these methods, um, there is a, a big roadblock, which is called the sign problem. So these Markov chain Monte Carlo um, methods, they rely on a sampling from a probability distribution that has to be generated. And in certain conditions, uh, when you want to st st study certain things, these probability distributions um, uh, suffer from a sign problem, which renders them, um, which render their, their generation completely numerically unstable and the completely unfeasible. So under certain situation, these methods, although they're very successful for uh, studying certain properties, they cannot be applied uh, at all. And unfortunately, some of these settings are extremely interesting <laughs> and uh, would be, yeah. So, so some example are, um, are, I have listed here are real time dynamics. So uh, classical Markov chain Monte Carlo is very good at static properties. Um, and cannot study dynamics. But uh, ideally, we would really want to, for example, here I put the picture, simulate. Uh, if we could simulate what happens, for example, in a particle collision, like what happens in, a, in the Large Hadron Collider, that would be great, right? Um, another setting uh, where uh, uh, the design problem afflicted is high baryon density. And these, for example, 
uh, is what uh, it means that uh, these uh, classical methods cannot study the matter structure uh, inside the neutron star where there is an extremely high baryon density. And it also means that, for example, in QCD, in the, in the chemical potential versus temperature phase space, uh, people cannot move uh, away from zero chemical potential. So people know very well what happens at, uh, at any temperature, but these methods just cannot be applied um, for when we move uh, uh, yeah, when we move to high baryon density, when the chemical potential is present. And finally, there is a third example, which is topological terms. And topological terms are interesting in high energy physics because they violate CP symmetry. So they have been considered as one of the possible explanation of the matter-antimatter imbalance in the universe. But again, these numerical methods just do not work. So hopefully this is where quantum computing comes to uh, comes to our help. Um, and um, in uh, when we are considering quantum simulation, we consider a Hamiltonian formulation of the theory compared to in, in contrast to the action formula formulation and that means that um, uh, it is this formulation is sign problem free so all these settings the, all these important questions and interesting questions that i told you about in principle they can be studied with a quantum computer and uh, um, and uh, of course they are also scalable to larger system because the exponential hilbert space is intrinsic in the system so if we could in principle um, scale to larger and larger quantum computer we could also study these questions uh, and the long-term goal of the, of the field of course is to to study these currently unanswerable questions in the standard model um, okay so this is the big uh, picture view, let me tell you what has happened so far in the field. Um, uh, so the first demonstration of uh, uh, the first experimental demonstration of a quantum simulation of lattice gate theories was in 2016, um, where uh, people used uh, um, trapped ions to study pair creation, so a real time dynamics uh, type of problem uh, for a U1 gauge theory. So U1 is an abelian group. Um, and uh, uh, and that was the really the first proof of principle demonstration. And since then, many advances has been made. But I just want to uh, point out that these advances, advances uh, might seem very incremental, but that's really how it needs to be done, right? So for the abelian theory, so where the gauge, the, gauge uh, symmetry group is abelian, usually U1 or Z2. Um, people have studied, uh, have, have studied the same system using, for example, uh, ultra cold atoms in this other paper um, in uh, one special dimension. So everything is one special dimension. And then in the, just last year, uh, some people in our group started studying the first uh, two dimensional abelian system. And this is a, a pure gauge theory where no matter is present. Okay, so for the abelian sites, people have uh, studied um, models with gauge fields and dynamical matter or in, in one dimension or in two dimension with only gauge field. For the non-abelian gauge theories, they are much more complicated in their structure. I will tell you a bit more about it later. Uh, the main work so far has have dealt with um, pure gauge uh, theories, so where no dynamical matter is present, and these two work deal respectively with SU2 and SU3. And of course, SU3 is a huge goal for us because it describes QCD, so that's something that people are really really interested in. But in QCD, um, yeah, one of the like uh, an extremely interesting question is what happens with matter, and none of this work uh, included dynamical matter in the description. Description. And that's what where we come in. We, we studied, I promised you a study of uh, hadron masses. So there will be hadron and there will be uh, matter fields in our, in our model. Okay, so let me start by giving you just a quick summary of how the Hamiltonian formulation works. It was first formulated by Cogot and Susskind in 75. And um, you have a spatial lattice, right? So time is continuous, it's not discrete is not discretized. And then on the vertices of the lattice, you have um, alternatively either matter or antimatter sites. So here in my picture, the matter are full circle, the antimatter are stripe circle. Um, and then on the link of the side, the side is where the gauge field leaves. Um, and you can imagine, right, they mediate the interaction between the matters. And then specifically, we choose an SU2 lattice gauge theory, uh, which is the smallest non-abelian group. So it's really the simplest thing we could choose uh, that had non-abelian features. Um, we have at the matter side, two colors, 
right, because of the group. So we have red or, or green uh, fermions at the vertices. Uh, on the links, I said that there lived the gauge field, and the gauge field for a non abelian theory are characterized by this uh, parallel transporter U, and the left and the right electric field L and R. Yeah. Um, so if you have any familiarity with an abelian theory, you already know that it, it is the structure of the gauge field is much much simpler for an abelian theory. Okay, but let's look at the let's look at the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian has mostly these three terms, which I think are quite intuitive. So here in um, in pink, we have the free uh, fermion mass. Uh, so that is just the energy cost for creating um, matters in my model. And the, the minus one to the n is just a signature of the staggered fermion. So that is a technical question, a technical issue that is needed to fix some uh, something in the continuum limit. And then the in green, we have the free gauge field energy. So that is the, en the energy I have to pay to create Field, uh, gauge fields on the links. And finally, I have the kinetic term, which describes the interaction between the matter and the gauge field. And of course, everything is, is made in such a way that is gauge invariant. Um, now, as I said, the structure for the for this SU2, um, for the gauge field of the SU2 lattice gauge theory is a bit complicated. So just you don't need to look at the details of this, but this is just to give you a quick flavor um, uh, of the of the Hilbert space of the gauge field. It's infinite dimensional. It's quite complicated. Uh, for SU two specifically, it can be in, uh, it can be mapped exactly onto a quantum rigid rotor, uh, so that's very helpful. But still, you can imagine that modeling this on a quantum computer can be quite complicated. So uh, one important, very important thing in the Hamiltonian formulation is that the Hamiltonian itself is not enough to determine completely the, 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 the dynamics and the physics of the system. We also have what is called a Gauss law. So uh, 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 the, the Gauss law, if you went back to an abelian theory, would be exactly the Gauss law that you expect. So it describes the flux of the gauge field, of the electric field in an abelian case, um, as determined by the charges. Right, so uh, for every vertices, I have uh, a Gauss law, um, and one important thing is that the only physical states in the um, in this model are the state that obey the Gauss law. So I have for each vertices one Gauss law, and all these have to be um, uh, respected to have a physical state, and all these constraints give me an exponentially small physical uh, subspace in the total Hilbert space of the of the model, and this is also part of what makes uh, these gauge theories very hard to study and to simulate just because you have all this constraint, they have to be respect respected so you can make different choices about how you want to um, enforce this constraint when in, uh, in your model. So the choice that we have made specifically uh, relies on the fact that we are considering a one-dimensional system, one spatial dimension with open boundary condition. Um, because it turns out that in this case, um, you can eliminate the gauge field um, and because the gauge fields are not truly dynamical de degrees of freedom, uh, which just means that they are completely determined by the matter configuration. This is not true with periodic boundary condition or in more than one spatial dimension. Okay, so this is one limitation that I want to clarify. So uh, more formally, this just means that there exists a gauge transformation that maps the original Hamiltonian that I had, which contained both fermionic and gauge, uh, gauge degrees of freedom, into a, a unitarily equivalent Hamiltonian that has only fermionic degrees of freedom. And this is already a huge simplification in the model that I'm considering because I have only fermions to consider, right? No, no more um, infinite dimensional gauge field Hilbert space. Uh, and I just want to point out that this comes at a cost. Uh, and the cost is that if you look at the green term, the gauge field energy, now it has been expressed in terms of the fermionic degrees of freedom, but you can see that uh, it is a long, a long range interaction between the fermions, right? So, so that is the, the cost that we, we, we have to pay in order to eliminate the, in, eliminate the gauge field. Um, however, we, we decided to do it because we really, really wanted to map this model onto currently available quantum hardware and do a real quantum simulation. So we really needed to be as um, resource efficient as possible. Okay, so now I have my fermionic Hamiltonian. The next step, 
uh, it's actually quite standard and is done also, for example, for simulation in quantum chemistry. When you have a fermionic Hamiltonian, jordan wigner transformations are uh, what you use to map this onto a spin onto a spin chain, right? So we are getting closer and closer to a, to a computer. Um, so in this case, because I have uh, <clears throat> two possible colors, uh, you can see that for a lattice with n sites, I have eliminated the gauge field. I will need two n qubits in order to simulate it. Um, and the, uh, yeah, this picture just shows you the topology of how I decide to map these fermionic degrees of freedom onto one um, one dimensional uh, spin chain. Um, and then, so applying the jordan wigner transformation, I just get my spin Hamiltonian with this exotic long range interaction. And then I'm just gonna show it to you, just to, just to, to show you again that it has the same structure, the mass term, the free, um, uh, the free gauge, the uh, gauge field free energy term and the interaction term. Um, and uh, this, mod, this, uh, this, mod, this spin model is platform and simulation protocol independent, right? You, once you have taken this, you could simulate an SU2 um, lattice gauge theory with dynamical matter onto your favorite quantum platform with your favorite uh, quantum simulation protocol. However, uh, what we decided to do was to perform a variational quantum simulation of this. And uh, this is because if you look at the uh, if you if you look at the Hamiltonian, it can be quite difficult to implement it directly onto onto quantum hardware. Right? It has this uh, three and four body interaction term. It has this no no, no diagonal gauge field energy term. So so a variational quantum uh, eigensolver is what we aimed at. Um, and in order to do that more efficiently, let me just tell you a bit about the symmetries of the model. So for this, uh, for this S2 uh, gauge theory, the symmetries that we consider are the three uh, total non-abelian charges and the baryon number. So these are just operators that commute with the Hamiltonian that I showed you before. Um, and uh, uh, we set the total charges to zero. Uh, and the baryon number uh, is exactly what you intuitive think of. It's what matters, uh, it's, it's what measures the imbalance between matter and antimatter. Um, so given these symmetries, um, we consider different states that we could study. Um, and one thing that I really want to point out is that the, in the uh, abelian theory, we don't have this richness of symmetries in the model. So we have just one abelian charge, which also coincides exactly with the baryon number, right? So in, a, in an abelian theory, it's impossible to build a state that is, uh, um, uh, that is uh, globally charge neutral and has non-zero matter and antimatter imbalance. While here in this non-abelian case, it is possible and it, it is just a, a specifically non-abelian feature. Okay, so by looking at the states, we know that the ground state of the model is in the B equal zero sector. So we will call that the vacuum. And then we consider the first excited state in the B equal zero sector, the meson. Um, and then we, as another state, we consider the, the non-abelian signature. We consider the ground state of the B equal one sector and we call that a baryon. And uh, once we defined and uh, we understood these states, the the aim will be to calculate the masses of this particle, and the masses will just be given by the energy gap between those levels and the and the vacuum. Yeah. Um, so those are the, the features we are after. And then, as I said, we considered as a, a quantum algorithm and a variational quantum eigensolver. So this is my quick summary of how it works. Um, I hope it's clear. Um, so uh, in a variational quantum Huygens solver, it's a hybrid algorithm. You have both a quantum processor and a classical processor, right? And the goal is going to be to calculate the ground state of, some, of a certain target Hamiltonian age. And then in order to do that, the quantum processor is used to prepare a nonsense, uh, a gas state through a parameterized uh, uh, circuit here, U of theta. Um, and then uh, this, on that state, we measure the cost function that we want to minimize, which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Um, uh, the cost function is passed to the classical optimization, to our classical optimization algorithm that will uh, calculate some new uh, parameters, some um, new variational parameters to try, and we'll send it to the, to the quantum processor to try to prepare the state, measure the cost function again. And then this whole thing is iterated until hopefully it, uh, it converges to a minimum. So, um, so hopefully the optimization algorithm manages to find the, 
um, the variational parameters theta that minimizes the, the expectation value of the of the Hamiltonian. And therefore we have a, a recipe, we have the variation that we have the circuit that will prepare the ground state of my Hamiltonian. So the advantage of this uh, of this algorithm uh, are that it really, really low, lowers the requirements for the quantum hardware, right? You don't need to specifically prepare a, 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 um, a specific Hamiltonian. You just need to come up with, a hands, with an answer that is expressible enough, right? That, in, that, will, that can, in principle, reach your ground state. And also the variational nature of it protects you um, against certain, um, certain type of uh, experimental error that can happen. Um, so despite this, here you can see the picture of uh, one of the IBM chips that we used is this uh, seven, seven chips, um, uh, seven qubit chip, and uh, we still uh, we still had some issues, right? Because we the like we have this key choice in how to param parameterize our state, and of course one thing we did was to implement all the symmetries that we talked about. So we we prepared the, we designed a circuit that produced a state that re that would lie in exactly the symmetry sector that we wanted it to be. But it was still like this circuit were still a bit challenging for, for, the, for the specific hardware that we chose. So we had to come up with some extra tricks to make it more um, uh, feasible. Uh, and uh, so I will just quickly tell you about um, uh, what they what they consist of. So this is just a so here uh, you're seeing the variational circuit that we designed for the ground state in the B equals zero sector. So this is to find the vacuum state, right? And uh, you can already see that I have implemented some symmetries, likely, right? Because you can see some, vari some uh, variational parameters are set as the same or the opposite of each other. So this circuit is, uh, uh, is well thought of. Um, now, if you consider the, the um, vari variational state, you can see that the circuit can be split into two parts, one part that depends on the variational parameters and one part that doesn't, which is the one highlighted in pink. So if I look at the uh, calculation of the cost function, uh, we can see that we can redefine the Hamiltonian in such a way um, that the quantum hardware needs to prepare only the variational part of the circuit, while the rest of the calculation is delegated to classical post-processing, right? So this essentially allows us to um, lower the, the depth of the circuit that we really need to implement. And then after we have done this, we noticed that we could commute some of these gates away. So instead of uh, having, um, oh, so this is for an equal four um, lattice. So we needed eight qubits. So uh, once we realized that we could commute some gates away for this specific case, um, the, this, um, this uh, eight qubit circuit could actually be reduced to a six, a six uh, qubit circuit where the, uh, calculation of the expectation value over the inactive qubits could also be delegated to the classical post-processing. So we really did everything to shave down everything that uh, was not necessary for the quantum processor to do. We just um, uh, we just took care of it, right? So here is just the cost function rewritten to to express this idea. So starting from this um, uh, from the initial uh, circuit, we we end up with this six qubits uh, circuit that could that we implemented onto the specific chip that I told you about. Um, and here at the bottom, you just see the circuit with the gates with a specific topology of, the, of this chip. So we really simplified it as much as possible. So the same process we did for the circuit to calculate the baryon and to calculate the meson. Um, OK, so uh, let me show you the results for the, for the calculation of the baryon mass. So as I said before, the mass of the baryon is the energy gap between the baryon, the ground state of B equals one, and the ground state of B equals zero, the vacuum. Uh, so um, for n equals four, we just needed to calculate the ground state in these two different sectors of the Hamiltonian, and then take the difference in energy. And uh, here you can see as dots the experimental, the 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 experimental data that came from a calculation, from a quantum calculation, compared to the to the results from exact diagonalization. And you can see that we found really surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, but we were happy to see very good agreement, right? Um, and then um, we consider also the, the 
mass of the meson. And for the mass of the meson, there is this subtlety, right? Because everything I told you about this, about the variation of quantum eigensolver is that it's, it's designed to calculate the ground state of the Hamiltonian or the ground state of the Hamiltonian in a specific symmetry sector. So in order to access the meson, we needed to modify the cost function. Um, and you can see here written at the bottom. So the cost function um, just means that um, I first find the ground state in the B equals zero sector. And then I look for the meson by minimizing the energy while also penalizing any overlap with the previously found vacuum, right? I, the eigenstates have to be orthogonal. So if these both these constraints are satisfied, um, that's how I found uh, I, that's how I find the meson. And this is what this, uh, this graph is meant to represent. So um, the first step, uh, which is where we find the, the dots, um, is where we calculate the, the uh, energy of the vacuum. Um, so we find the, the specific theta V that will produce the vacuum. And then in order to, to find the meson, in the second step, I need both the variational uh, the the variational circuit of, to calculate the expectation value of the energy and the variational and and the circuit that will calculate the overlap with the state that I found before, right? So it's something that will be roughly double the depth of uh, what, what I had just for the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And then by combining these two into one single cost function, I was able to find in step three, the energy of the meson state. And then they're just taking the difference in panel four, um, uh, in panel D, I find the mass of the meson. And um, uh, you can see that this, <laughs> this already had higher requirements, right? More complicated circuit to implement. So we did this specifically on the quantum computer only for n equal two, which is very, very minimal lattice. Um, okay, so uh, after we calculate the, the, the masses of these two particles, um, also here we have very good agreement. Uh, we decided to try to look at something that had some physical, um, that had more physical meaning, right? Uh, so we decided to look at the, the mass ratio um, between the meson and the baryon. And that is because for an SU2 um, lattice case theory, um, there is this um, general result that the baryon and the meson have to be degenerate um, in, in mass in the continuum. Uh, so, um, uh, so he, here are the results that we calculated. So the lines are results for from ED for different lattice sizes, um, two, four, and six, and you can and then uh, the dots are the are um, mixed results um, that include the specific quantum computation, just completed with classical ED whenever quantum computation results were not available, um, and you can see that. Um, this, uh, the, the mass of these particles uh, are not very much uh, influenced by the size of the lattice, right? There's not too much difference between the different lattice sizes. Um, and that is just because it's um, intrinsically a very, a very local phenomenon, right? We were not looking at something that was extended in space, and we were just looking at a specific range of parameters where, where we could calculate the mass significantly on such small lattices. And, um, and the results from the from the quantum computation um, pretty much follow uh, follow the, the the ED results, and they go um, for larger and larger x towards the expected value of one. So we were very happy to see this confirmed, despite the very minimal size of the lattices that we we, we were studying. Um, okay, so um, I I'm just uh, yeah, sure. Ask, it's a very naive question, but is there a reason? why uh, you seem to always get a too high ratio, they're never too low? Um, why we seem to get it? <laughs> um, Maybe it says something about the, you know, the variational trick you use to get there or? Yeah, 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 I agree. There is certain, there is for sure a bias. Um, let me think where it could be specifically. Um, it could be, I mean, in this case, um, uh, I, I think it's just the, 
it's just how the experimental errors were were uh, were leaning towards. I I, I can't think of a, a general uh, a more, a more yeah more general answer than that. Right. Uh, but okay. it is true. Like we're always a, a bit too high. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So these are the results for the mass ratio, and then yeah. Just to just to conclude, I have delivered what I promised. I hope um, I showed you how to model an SU2 lattice case theory. Uh, in such a way uh, that can be mapped onto a quantum computer in the case of uh, one spatial dimension with open boundary condition. And then I showed you some quantum computation of the low line spectrum via this hybrid variational quantum eigensolver algorithm. And then uh, we were we are very excited about this work because it has so many, <laughs> it's so minimal, it has so many di directions in which to expand, right? Um, with a, with a, a long-term goal in mind, of course, it is fundamental to extend to more spatial dimensions. And that is going to be a very challenging step just because the, the trick that I relied on here, the elimination of the gauge field cannot be done anymore. You just don't have enough constraint to eliminate completely the gauge field. So, so, so the gauge fields will have to be dealt in, in some way. And then of course, uh, already with this model, we can study, start studying some sign problem afflicted settings, right? We could do real time, them, real time um, evolution. We could include a chemical potential or a topological term. So this is, uh, for us, this is really um, uh, a, a stepping stone towards more and more exciting uh, and more and more realistic um, model in this uh, in this field of uh, sim quantum simulation for for lattice gauge uh, lattice gauge theories. Um, so with this, um, I'll just uh, thank you for for your attention. Um, yeah, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Ingle, for an interesting talk. Uh, I see we already have questions. Uh, Anton. Yes, so I wanted to ask a bit. Um, so I'm thinking about your project in the context of uh, uh, usefulness and applicability of quantum computers. Um, mm -hmm. So you did mention various, uh, various open questions for the extension. And yeah. Um, there is there is one thing in particular that I noticed, uh, and that is uh, in order to map the problem on spins or qubits, you end up with a highly non-local Hamiltonian, yeah, which is uh, which is essentially like uh, almost all to all interaction. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here in this uh, here in this um, the gauge field term, yeah, you have uh, um, yeah all to all interaction. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to to re to improve the locality of the Hamiltonian by introducing auxiliary degrees of freedom? Or uh, so I, I'm now trying to to think what would be alternative approaches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So, um, uh, so if you remember, I told you that this uh, this long range interaction were a cost that we had to pay in order to eliminate the gauge degrees of freedom, right? And we wanted to eliminate the, the gauge degrees of freedom for a question of uh, hardware efficiency. We didn't have so many qubits that we could simulate all of them. Um, but in principle, um, if I could have my dream quantum computer, I would not need to eliminate the gauge degrees of freedom. I could have specific qubits or qubits or whatever quantum degrees of freedom I want to model the gauge degrees of freedom, and then the the interaction would resemble more the original one, which is uh, very much local, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it, it's with this, it's always a, a bit of a balancing trick, um, right? So here in this specific case, the lattice we consider was also not not too big, so we didn't, you know, this long range were not really uh, infeasible, but of course, if we go to larger lattice, larger and larger lattice sizes, this, this could be a problem. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a balancing issue of uh, how, ma how many resources and how flexible resources I have versus how complicated of a model I, I, I'm going to obtain. Um, also, a related question, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. So, so with with the traditional quantum computers, of course, uh, 
you're limited that you all, always end up with spins. Is, uh, um, uh, is there perhaps a more domain specific hardware which would be more better suited to simulate uh, lattice gauge theories? So yeah. what, what, what yeah, are yeah, the yeah. things that you would benefit from? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so they are for sure, right? Qubits are not the, the end of everything. So just as an example, there are other um, lattice gauge theory that we consider where the matter instead of fermionic was bosonic. Uh, so yeah, so we had an infinite dimensional Hilbert space and, uh, uh, and we have a proposal to model that using the microwave, uh, the, the mode of a, uh, the photo mode of a microwave cavity, right? Which resem would resemble more that type of Hilbert space. Um, or uh, there are also other people in our group who are working, uh, for example, in the in the billion case, in the billion case, the Hilbert space of the gauge fields is not as complicated as this uh, quantum rotor thing. It just resembles more an infinite ladder equally spaced, right? Um, and then in order to model that, we are considering uh, QDITs built within trapped ions, right? So the internal states of the, uh, the, the ions, we can, yeah, we can map them to, um, they're not infinite, of course, but uh, given certain circumstances, we can, uh, we know that the physics is concentrated in a few levels, and then we can take those few levels and map them onto these uh, qubits instead of just uh, two state qubits. Uh, so there are absolutely Absolutely, um, more um, more proposals and more physical hardware that uh, that can be can be useful. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Maybe before we get more questions, I can go next. I actually have a sort of indirect follow up on this. Mm -hmm. Something I'm always very interested in are these differences between like a digital and analog approaches. And I noticed that in condensed matter we solve a lot of things like digitally. While the simulation kind of proposals are lacking mainly because it's very hard. And I noticed that like in sort of this like high energy where you are coming from, it sort of came from the opposite side, right? I think before your proposal, people were thinking much more like ultra cold atoms kind of simulation. And like, do you have kind of perspective about how, how this competing approaches can compete with each other in terms of like... Uh, scaling and like where do, where do you yeah where do, or precision like where do you see this going I know there is no like any precise benchmarks right now but it's I think it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting how there are these two developing approaches to these things yeah 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 absolutely so uh yeah there are these um uh there are also these ultra cold atoms proposals uh, and they focus on a, on a on a slightly different thing right because in this proposal uh, in, or at least yeah in general in this type of proposals um, one key feature that they want to maintain and why they is the is the preservation of the gauge symmetry so instead of eliminating the gauge field like we do uh, they consider these uh, symmetries that they can realize with these ultra cold atoms and they really aim at uh, uh, creating interactions that will preserve that symmetry in the model so so in this comparison between digital and analog i would say that it is really, really high. Like one thing that I learned from this is that everything is so, so dependent on specific capabilities of the, of the hardware, right? So um, once, we, for example, in this case, once we decided we wanted to go with the superconducting chips, we had so many limita limitations and we had really to shave everything off until we, we were left with something that could be done. Um, but already, uh, yeah, related also to the previous question, right? When we, when we start to look at other hardwares, for example, like trapped ions have all to all connectivity and that would be a huge advantage compared to, uh, uh, but it, it just depends on what specific question you want to, you want to answer and the, the specific capabilities of the hardware are, are just for me, uh, <laughs> made, made it make it very, um, yeah, very specific and very hard to give a general answer, I think. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Do we have more questions? Uh, uh, perhaps, so. uh, yeah. <laughs> I have uh, also another question. Can you comment yeah. uh, on the error rate? So um, I'm, I'm not so well aware about 
the IBM machines and the errors that one can achieve on these. But uh, do you have a handle, say, uh, if one had more qubits of uh, of the scale, how how large of a system could one, in principle, simulate without errors being the dominant limiting factor? Mm -hmm. um, so we here again we we were thinking about um so sc scaling what we did for uh, for lattice for larger lattices on the same hardware um can become quickly problematic right because we need we have like uh, if we use the same ideas in creating a variational state with similar symmetries um then we would need probably more connectivity than uh, an ibm chip could afford um uh so when we start we we have uh, when we started doing thinking about something with large, larger lattice sizes we we have already moved away from from the specific superconducting uh, qubits and we we're thinking more towards the trapped ions uh trapped ion systems um so in the in the uh, in the case of this of this work um I think the error rates were quite under control, right? It, it is a relatively small system, and then we did some kind of uh, error mitigation techniques, just the standard like linear extrapolation, and everything seemed to work very, very fine. Like here, the error bars are almost invisible. You can, you can, uh, they are they are all very small, uh, and. So for larger system sizes, we'll just probably change hardware. And then it will be a whole new questions again. Then we will have to learn again what is the limiting factor, whether the yeah, the strength of the interaction or the coherence time. So yeah, it's gonna be all new. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Maybe that I can also ask another follow-up that is maybe a little bit like beyond the scope, but I am wondering, you mentioned this variational methods at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, how How is the precision of the variational methods in these problems? Do you happen mm -hmm. to know, like, is, is the VQE really the savior here because of the sign problem, or are there other methods that get a decent, decent precision for this ground state kind of things? Um, so the variational yeah um other other quantum algorithm to calculate the ground state and how the precision compares hmm i see i don't even mean necessarily quantum even like other classical just like monte mm -hmm. carlo or, or people just gave up on the monte carlo for this kind of problems it's a no 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 so uh, yeah so one thing that it's important to clarify right the 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 quantities that we calculated here were energies, are static properties. Uh, quantum Monte Carlo people, are, sorry, classical Monte Carlo people are very good at this, right? So, so yeah. we are not competing on the uh, on the computation of these specific masses. Uh, like whatever they can do is miles ahead of us. They can do it on lattices, you know, like order of magnitude bigger than whatever we can dream of. Um, so, so for these specific quantities, they are, yeah. Uh, there's uh, there's no competition, but, but uh, as I said, like for us, this is really a, a, a stepping stone, right? This is the first step. We have calculated the model. We have calculated some physical quantities that seem to make sense, and from there, uh, we really want to go next to something that can outcompete the the classical the classical methods, at least in principle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 makes sense. Thank you, Ignacio. I saw a raised hand. I think. Do you have yeah, a question? I, I have a question about, I think it's slide 17, when you show the um, variational answers used, and you yeah. say, well, you only actually implement in the quantum computer the variational part, right? The part that it's far yeah. track. And then you say the other one, you do it in post-processing. Yeah. Does that mean that you uh, just run it on a classical computer and yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, uh, there's a whole part of uh, measurement that I skipped, right? Uh, so one of the main, uh, like the uh, one of the main jobs of the quantum processor is to calculate the expectation value of this Hamiltonian. Yeah, but the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, I, I showed you before, right? It has this long range, very weird, like spin 
uh, uh, all to all interaction terms. So, so when we are dealing with qubits, uh, we cannot measure the full Hamiltonian completely. We have to decompose the Hamiltonian first into groups that can be measured simultaneously. It's um, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole process behind that that I just hit under the rug. But when I say that that is um, uh, done uh, classical processing, it, it means essentially that I take it's the last equation here. I take the Hamilton, the initial Hamiltonian that I wanted to measure it. I transform it with the static part of the circuit, right? And then with the, whatever, like, whatever extra layers I had to use in order to measure that full Hamiltonian onto the onto the, um, the, the the quantum hardware, I do it again for this new Hamiltonian. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Good, good. So that effectively, uh, if you were to implement everything on the quantum computer, it would be a much longer circuit. Yes, exactly. Uh, and for, exactly. For, bigger, for bigger system sizes, I guess this is not feasible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Do we have anything more? Let me double check Grace's heads and the chat. I'm just going to give it a sec if anyone has any more questions, comments. Seems like that's not the case. So thank you so much, Singlai, for your very interesting talk. And thanks, everyone, for coming and participating in the discussion.